call the meeting to order if everyone's ready. I do have one adjustment to the agenda during discussion matters 6.3 we're just going to have a short conversation about the land water cons land and water conservation fund application for the playground and this is a, a grant that we're applying for to get matching funds to support the playground so that'll be 6.3 Does anyone have any other adjustments to the agenda? Just the executive session. Right. Right. We will have an executive session as somewhere before adjournment. I don't know where it is on the agenda, but it'll be after we confirm our meeting dates and do the consent agenda. We'll go into executive session for for uh, two personnel issues. So. And with that, we'll move to audience communications. And looks like we have an audience. So if you would like to speak, you just state your name and. Uh, I'm Eric Brungan. I'm a teacher at the middle school and a, uh, a parent of uh, one child still in the middle school and one child that graduated from the middle school and doing quite well at CBU. So um, I just wanted tonight to, um, I know it's been a long process, but I wanted to thank all the board members and Alan and Patty who worked so hard to bring this building improvement bond vote to ballot. You've shown a willingness uh, to project a long-term vision for our school that is sorely needed. I really appreciate it. The improvements are long overdue. They're dearly needed, and I support the, bo the bond vote. Thanks for having the courage and the vision in this matter. I really appreciate it. Great. Next. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Katie Kennedy. I am a community member. I'm also married to Eric Brunband, um, so parent of a... Of a SCS graduate and is current seventh grade student and I just would really like to um, also express my thanks. Um, I am so excited about the prospect of this bond being passed and having the physical structure of our building um, being improved so it will do justice to the staff, to the administration, to the community and most importantly to the students in our school because I think it's been, it's long overdue. I think about um, a teacher giving a leading an enthusiastic discussion in one classroom not interrupting another class next door taking a test if we're able to have classrooms that are dedicated to each class and, and are you know have doors that they can close for privacy and also for security reasons um, so I just want to say thank you and I wholeheartedly support this proposal Great. thanks I'm Alice Brown I'm a um, former SCS parent I could not say any more eloquently what Eric just said, but I fully support this bond. I think, again, it's long overdue. The school board has been so good over the last long number of years of being very fiscally prudent, which is just a wonderful thing. And I think now we just have to suck it up and, and do the improvements that need to get done. All right. And I'm Demi Simons, and I'm here as a parent of three children at the community school. I have an eighth grade daughter, I have a third grade son, and I have a kindergarten son. So clearly we will be here for quite a while in the school. I'm also a substitute teacher between Shelburne and Charlotte, so I get to see the differences between the buildings. And um, I would like to let you know that my husband and I really support this bond because we moved here just shy of two years ago, and we chose Shelburne because we were UVM students we knew how much this community um, supported uh, the children, and that's why we selected to, uh, to live in Shelburne as opposed to any of the other uh, surrounding communities. And um, I'm very concerned about the safety for my children in the school, as well as for the educational um, distractions that seem to go on with some of these open classrooms. I have two out of my three children are in the classrooms where uh, uh, stu other students go past or teachers and it is a, a big distraction um, including my son's kindergarten class which it's very difficult to keep 16 kindergartners contained when they have a constant distraction of people passing by. So. I would like to thank the board for um, considering this bond and putting it on um, 
the ballot because I think this is extremely overdue and needed um, in our community to continue for our um, the education of our children. So thank you. Great. Thanks for the thanks for the comments. Appreciate it. And uh, you guys aren't going to speak. You're part of the presentation. Okay. I want to see if you're inspired after those great words. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, thanks very much for just coming to the meetings and speaking your mind. I'm not saying whether I should say yay or nay next to my good friend Bob Finn. But uh, I always like it when folks come to these meetings and participate and, uh, and show that they're part of the process. So thank you very much. So with that, we'll move on to uh, 4.0, which is a presentation on prevention, which I believe is going to go up on here. Well, thank you. Um, so as Megan, um, kind of on the heels of what Megan um, talked about uh, just a little while ago, we have a prevention presentation um, as part of our student supports. And I want to start by introducing some of the people here who are going to speak um, through this PowerPoint. So Pat Wilder is our Howard um, social worker. And Sue Schaefer is a behavioral interventionist who works in our kind of planning room area. And Alice Brown is the head of our mentoring program at SCS. So I just want to make sure that they're acknowledged before they speak. And we really want to thank Christine Lloyd Newbury also, who put this together. So um, with a couple of tweaks from us. So um, as you can see here, we have uh, we're out three years in our prevention task force. The um, all of the CSSU schools have a long history of recognizing and supporting the importance of preventing um, health risk behaviors of students. So over these last three years, both CSSU and the CY have worked together closely to identify a formal um, prevention framework that can be used in all of our schools and communities. The goal of that framework is to ensure that all of our students receive a standard level of um, education in the area of alcohol, tobacco, and drug prevention. So the CSSU Prevention Task Force, which was created in 2002, did have a goal of identifying the areas most in need of prevention services. And we assessed our current prevention systems, and that led to the creation of a CSSU prevention framework. The framework is intended to provide our school, SCS, with a way to align our needs with the latest best practices. So if you look here, we have programs. The programs are multifaceted. We want to make sure they're integrated. All good prevention programs are integrated with home, school, and community in mind. Um, we do set a no use norm for our youth. Um, um, encouraging parental involvement and monitoring and maintaining the, this norm of no use. And no use is? Oh, excuse me, no use of alcohol, tobacco, oh. or other drugs. Sorry. Um, it's an interactive approach, and we adhere to an evidence-based practice. <coughs> and obviously, we're limiting our youth access to alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs in all settings across our campus. So the goals of our program are up here. Um, enhancing our cognitive behavioral competency to reduce and prevent a variety of health risk behaviors. We want our students to know the, the risks. Teach our students all the necessary skills so they're resisting any kind of peer pressure to use any of those, those substances. Increase <coughs> their knowledge of the immediate consequence of substance abuse. Increase students' abilities to be present, learn, succeed in our schools without any kind of substance abuse. Reduce our rates of substance abuse and decrease the problems that result from that. And ensure that our youth are receiving a consistent message that supports this no use 
um, of alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs as a community norm for all of our students and all youth. So the pieces of our um, framework are up here. Um, we'll speak to all these pieces. We have a variety of services and supports available to all of our students at SCS. And through our partnership with Connected Youth um, and our other organizations. So as we go forward, we'll have Alan and, I think it's Alan and Sue and Alice and Pat speak to the remaining slides. Okay, and I'll just take us back to our goals for a second, because I think that's Kind of a really good starting point to talk about how, how are we doing and then we'll describe the program that I think is incredibly effective. The piece I put on the table is um, I've been your administrator, your middle school co-principal for five years. I've never had a tobacco and alcohol or drug incident at Sheldon Community School. It hasn't happened. Um, I think that speaks for itself. Um, you know, I, can, I can tell you that that's, that's not the norm in middle schools. Uh, the, the schools I came from in Alaska, it was a daily event, and a regular event. And so um, I think the program that we're gonna lay out for you, one, it's a function of obviously a community, we have a lot of community support, but I think the program that we want you to see is incredibly effective because um, as I talk with some folks who've been at Shelburne Community School for more than a decade, um, specifically I go back to Rachel Petraskin, um, you're going to get to hear from Rachel Petraska next month when she talks about counseling. She said, share one story, just for context. And that is when, in her first year in 2001, when she came to Shelburne Community School, um, she actually did her interview on 420, which you may or may not know is kind of a you know, national marijuana celebration day, unfortunately. And she met middle school students on their way out the door to go smoke, and they were very open about it. We're going off to smoke weed, and we'll be back. And she talked about drug use prevalent in the school, drug dealing in the school, um, and other things. That's not the school I know now. And as, as she describes it, I'm like, Are you, you've got to be kidding me. And you can ask her about it when she's here if, if you care. But um, the one thing she says is, we didn't have a pre prevention program in 2001. That's the difference. So let's share a program that I think is doing a pretty tremendous job. So. It does have these pieces. The first piece we'll talk about is obviously we start with education. ATOD just stands for alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. And obviously we start, this is a K-8 program. And it's really something that Rachel and Katie are pretty instrumental with. And we made a conscious choice to have them come talk about that piece next month. But And Rachel and Katie are our school counselors. Our school counselors, yeah. You know. um, but these are the pieces that are there. Um, we have some real prioritized pieces over the last three years. We conducted a comprehensive school health index assessment. That's an assessment, um, again, research-based that says this is what you should be doing as a school. We analyzed, are we doing it? Um, so you'll hear next week about the next month about the developmental school counseling program. The pieces that I'd highlight here are you know, the that what we have created over the past four to five years is, you might have heard the term skills for life curriculum. That is a weekly class that all our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders receive, um, taught by a variety of folks. And the curriculum's right there. Counselors do life skills. Um, the planning room, it used to be Georgine, now Rachel Oberst and I teach about bullying and harassment, a very intentional set of lessons. Um, Sue Schaefer and I are currently teaching drug and alcohol awareness. Those lessons are ongoing as we speak. Um, Coming up next month, I'll work with Jocelyn and we'll teach about reproductive health. And it, Skills for Life is going to be where we are going to do some of our early personal learning plan, our PLP work. Um, that's actually gonna start in a couple months. Our social studies teachers are taking the lead in developing a curriculum to help our students identify their core principles, which is one of the pieces of the PLP, which we hope will really drive the whole process of how do we develop personalized learning? How can we make this relevant to our young people. So that's all skills for life. You might go back to the budget and remember that one of the decision packets you saw early on was our request for a health educator. We were. Yeah. yeah. We pulled it off. <laughs> and it was unfortunate. But. And it, it's a reality, but we'll just put it there. We wanted to put the reminder there. It is our long-term goal to have a certified health educator. I think we do a really good job at this. 
But I can tell you today, today I had an incident that pulled me out of the classroom because my highest priority has to be with student safety and that issue. So Sue was left by herself to, to do those lessons with multiple classes. It works, but it's less than ideal because you can see all these other people play multiple roles in our school. So that is one piece where we say, boy, we, a health educator who is really committed to that, I think, could make a big difference for us. And a certified teacher. Yeah. Wow. Um, how, would this, how would this fit in with the way special ed is shifting to the SU? I mean, would somebody like this? Um, well, at this point, none of those, none of the, the our prevention team from a special ed funding perspective falls under the umbrella of special education. So uh, in one sense, um, doesn't have anything to do with special ed consolidation. What it does have to do with, and, and some of this work has its roots in coordinated school health, that as an SU, we're trying to move that work forward. And um, as that work moves forward, is there an opportunity to be able to, I mean, we've talked about this at the level we can talk about it right now, which is still sort of just agreement across the district, but could we eventually be in a place where there are SU level positions like this that can be shared? Exactly. Um, that's, that is where I think we could go, and just the conversations through the course of this budget season, we aren't there yet, unfortunately. Um, but it's, that is, so not connected to special ed, Yes, exactly, <laughs> Russ. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my. That was his gift. Show you away again. That's great. Oh, okay. yeah. That's a good question. For the record, Russ's t-shirt said, if we were a red, this wouldn't, we wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> it's this gift from the SU. It's nice. Mm -hmm. right. So another piece that is um, incredibly important, and this is, this is again research-based, it's an important part of our framework, is we know that relationships are the key. Relationships between adult and students, and students to students. And if that's not the basis of our school, all our prevention education can just go right out the window. And so we're very intentional about this, and these are a couple pieces where we have a couple guests who will share their expertise. And there are some of the programs, one of which is our CY mentoring program. CY being Connecting Youth, our CSSU level, really drug and alcohol prevention kind of umbrella. So Alice, can I turn it over to you to talk about mentoring? Can I talk from here? Do I move? Can I be heard? I guess I can. Our preferred piece. Right here? Um, Very bashful. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, no. Is it at 15 minutes, right, Alan? <laughs> um, I coordinate the CY mentoring program at Shelburne Community School. Again, we're from Connecting Youth, overseen by CSSU with Christine Lloyd Newberry at the helm. We have mentor coordinators at each of the contributing schools in Charlotte, um, Williston, Hinesburg, and Shelburne. And um, we have a very strong program. Um, I inherited a group. Two, uh, this is my second year. So um, starting the fall of 2012, there were 11 matches. Um, I came in for the fall of 2013. We got 18 matches, 18 pairs in our program. Right now we're up to 25 matches. There is a continued um, interest in growing this program because there are plenty of children that we think would benefit from the mentoring program. And district-wide, we seem to have about 9% of the eligible 5th through 8th graders in the mentoring programs at the other CSU, CASSU schools. So that would mean growing our program, if possible, up to somewhere between 35 and 35, 30 and 35 matches to get us to the 9%. Um, I love my job. I get to work with the best volunteers and the community. I get to work with the great kids. I have full support from Pat Wilder and Rachel Petraska and Rachel Tebow, the ELL, ELL teacher from Alan Miller, from all the middle school teachers, um, all of whom I'm always continually harassing um, because it is a partnership between all the people in the school to work together to help our kids. Um, our kids in the mentoring program are chosen um, often by the teachers, sometimes by the guidance counselor from Pat Wilder as kids who will benefit from this program. Um, I, um, everybody feels good about mentoring. Oh, an adult gets together with a kid and it's a soft, squishy, good feeling. 
but I have a science background and I don't do well with this something feeling good. And um, fortunately, a lot of the organizations that are supporting mentoring right now, which are government organizations and um, corporations nationwide, there's this very strong mentoring program growing right now. Um, all those groups giving money want to see data. They want to see that it really does work. It doesn't just feel good. So there are countless studies that are being done over the last few years about the success of mentoring programs. Um, 2014, Mentor released the Mentoring Effect, the first ever nationally representative survey of young people. This was a survey of 18 to 20 year old kids who were in, um, they were at risk youth who had a mentor. And of those at risk kids who had a mentor, 55% were more likely to be enrolled in college than those who didn't have a mentor. 81% were more likely to report participating regularly in sports or other extracurricular activities. More than twice as likely they were to have a leadership position in a club or sports team. 78% more likely to volunteer regularly in the communities. Why do we care about those numbers? Because kids who have more connections in the community, such as being in a sport, um, going to college, um, volunteering are less likely to engage in risky behaviors, which is the whole point of the prevention. So mentoring works. We have a great program at the school. We do surveys um, at the end of the year for our mentors with our kids. They all seem to think the program is working from their side as well. So um, that is where we're working with the mentoring program. And we thought since we have pre three presentations, we pause kind of after each speaker so you could ask any questions that you had of Alice. Um, other than waiting till the end? What are wrenches and jabbers? <laughs> oh, that's a really good question. That's a um, program that Alan brought into the school last year. These two fascinating men um, who came in and talked with, well, the Alan should talk. I only got to hear it all. Yeah, it's part of our school-wide education program because that's one of the pieces. And it's two gentlemen, um, Larry Bissonette and Tracy Thresher, who are worldwide recognized worldwide recognized advocates for autism. They are um, middle-aged gentlemen who have been actually really severe deficits in communication from the time they were children and actually institutionalized and through the Howard Center have learned to communicate through iPads. And they've, Wretches and Jabbers is the name of a documentary that was created about them and so we have our six, seventh, and eighth graders watch the documentary, and then Larry and Tracy actually come and visit and have a question and answer session with us. It's been incredibly powerful in terms of the impact, um, just kind of that that level of awareness that you know we we're, we're all more similar than we are different. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's great. Isn't one of the gentlemen an accomplished artist as well? He is. If you recognized artist, you, know, you might when you walk through our school. If you look in our hallway, there's kind of this hallway that now is filled with puzzle pieces. And there's a piece of art hanging in the middle that um, Larry does, does his own artwork. And so he shared that the first year. And we asked him, could we buy a piece? And he actually said, no, no, but I'll come and paint one for you and do it here and dedicate it to you. So that's one of the pieces on the wall. Yeah, it's very cool. So any questions for Alice? Thank you very much, Alice. Appreciate it. Um, so another piece is our behavioral supports. And so for that, um, we've asked Sue Schaefer to come. Again, we're thinking again, our, our focus is here on adult-student relationships, but more so student-student relationships here. So, Sue, I'll Thanks. let you talk. Um, Alan, originally asked, excuse me, originally asked me to speak about SCAT, which is the after-school program. And I said, well, I, I, I really can't, can't just only speak about that because they're all combined in, in, in a sense. And by that I mean sort of my day job is um, behavior interventionist and after school is SCAT and the um, mentors and volunteers is sort of something else that I developed over the course of um, the last 15 years and that is um, the volunteers. So for example, they recycle the building um, twice a week, the whole building, and they work in the library and um, some of the older kids go into the classrooms with younger kids. Um, so that's all a volunteer program and they all are tied in together because um, I sort of keep my ear to the ground, if you will, and I'm always um, philosophically thinking I want to um, break down barriers, clicks. And so when, we, when I um, look for SCAT offerings, I um, try to 
get a sense of, of where the kids are at and what they're involved in and what their interests are in. And, and by the way, just a, a quick aside, it started um, a little more than 10 years ago with six students. Um, this year we will surpass 300. Um, we last year were around 260. This year will be 300. So that's really the biggest current program in the school. Um, and, and some of the offerings for that are um, oh, quadcopters. They, they are building quadcopters. And by the way, I, I, I also want to, a quick aside, say that um, I'm, I'm really supported by this school. And I can go to Alan and every now and again and I'll say, I just need a little more money. I remember I, there, there were more kids that wanted to take quadcopter than we had quadcopters. And so what do you do? So he, he, he sprung me for another hundred dollars. But uh, at any rate, so it's really supported. And, we, and, and um, you know, we offer cooking, we offer you name it, um, art, all kinds of art. Um, I guess I want to say this. If you can, if you can find out what a, what a student's gift is, you've got them, and and that's really what I look for. Um, I look for it for in my day job, and I look for it in my after school job. So that means um, there might be a kid that's extremely gifted in an area, and and for whatever reason he's not doing well in class, or maybe he's doing spectacularly in class but he just needs something else. So I'm gonna be trying to figure out now, how can I offer that in an after school program? Or how can I stimulate that guy or that girl within the confines of the school day in the capacity of what they're doing with their schoolwork? So it truly is all tied into one, sort of one vision for where the school's going. And again, with PLPs coming down, personal learning plans, um, I said to Alan, we were talking about that the other day, and I said, well, gosh, we've been doing that for years already. Because, um, again, I don't care if they're in a kindergarten or if they're in the eighth grade. If you find out what they love, you've got them. And, and that's really what we set out to do. Um, I'm just going to tell you a very quick story. There was a kid a few years back. It took me two years to figure out what he liked. I, I threw everything at him I could possibly think of. I finally accidentally figured out it was that he liked to, he liked to work in the library, putting books away. Um, and so we came up with a program for that. So when I tell you they're all tied together, it really is, it's, it's volunteer um, sorts of things, it's prevention, um, it's after school activities, sort of all wrapped into one. That sounds like it's exactly in line with a TED talk that Alice Brown sent out to uh, a, a link for to all of the mentors and it's called something about finding the spark in every child. Mm -hmm. exactly. And that's going to the child and asking them yep. what that spark is, what, what mm -hmm. fires them up. And I have to tell you, when you find the sparks, they break down every barrier. They break down socioeconomic barriers. They break down um, um, grade barriers, if you will, in the sense of achievement. They really do so. Um, great job. <coughs> How much time do you spend with each child and on what schedule and how, how does this work? How, you know, what type of interaction do you have? With <laughs> you, you probably don't want to know what time I get to work in the morning. But um, I, I go there pretty early and I, and sometimes I stay pretty late and I, and I work from home a lot. I remote in. Um, I see, I, I, I probably every week if I include the volunteer programs, I probably see, I don't know, 60, 70 kids. I see a lot of kids. More importantly, I think I listen. And so um, I, I listen to what's going on with the kids. So I listen to, uh, I might, if they're selling something in a hallway, I listen. If they're um, sitting in my office and they're crying, I listen. If they're, I mean, in whatever capacity, I'm listening and finding out what it is, what what can I do? What can I do to grab a hold of them and really to, to make them a part of the SCS community? Yeah, one piece I would add is we have an, an hourly, weekly meeting of each member of our middle school team. So Alpha meets for an hour, when meets for an hour, Holden meets for an hour, meet in my office. And really a lot of the focus is talking about kids. Yeah. And I can't tell you how often in the midst of that kid talk we'll be talking about Whoa, Alan is really struggling with this, struggling with this, struggling with this. Um, Sue, what can you do with it? 
you know, it, yeah. it is those students where we're just not successful in the classroom in, in some capacity, or we know something's going on, or we know we got a relationship issue. You, you run the full gamut of student, 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 adult relationship. Sue, Sue is one of our go-to people. Say, what can you do for us? Terrific. Yeah, right. it really is. Well, again, I, I want to say you get the kid, you can, if, you can, if, you can, if you find out what they love, you have them. I mean, you really do. And you have them all the way through school. And you know what? You have them in high school and you have them in college mm -hmm. or in whatever, in whatever. A lot of the kids throughout many of the years have kept in touch with me. And, and I see that. I looked out here in the hallway, coming down the hallway, and I'm looking at the picture and I'm thinking, yep, yep, yep. Because they did those same exact kinds of things back at SCS in the after school program or in another capacity that I saw them doing that in because we found out what they loved. And you've got them here. I see them. I see them on the wall. Thanks. Appreciate your time. All right. So let's go to the other piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, we don't, we're, we're not always successful. We do have students who get involved in substances or perhaps really a, a lot of our situations, they're in families where we know there's substance abuse issues. And, and that comes with complications for us at school. Um, so looking at you know, how do we reduce the risk, how do we reduce the rates, what can we do, what can we even do to train staff around it because that, that's not the norm. So um, right now, we don't have an SAP. That's typically, if you went to all of our other K-8 schools, you would find a student assistance program counselor, a, a certified drug and alcohol counselor. Um, the last one we had, we had Amy, mm, that's gonna be awful because I, I wasn't prepared for that. B-U-C. Yeah, we had Amy last year, and before that we had Margo Austin for an extended period of time. No, no, no. Buckley? Yeah, Buckley. Amy Buckley. Buckley, thank Buckley. you. Yeah, so Amy Buckley was with us last year, and since then, you know, we, we put the physician out there, and we didn't find a fit. And we said, okay, rather than just hiring a body because we have a pulse, we're, we're going to keep looking for the right one. Um, we, we filled in this year with actually one of the roles of the SAP is helping in the prevention education and actually the administrative assistant in the CY office, Le Leslie Johnson, is a certified teacher and has come over and helped us, kind of on loan from CY. Um, of course, she has just accepted a job. She loved being in the classroom again so much. She's accepted a job and a teacher of the death, and we gave her good recommendations, and off she goes. And we, but we'll get by through the end of the year, but it is something we're going to be looking to hire again. Our school counselors play a role. But we thought the piece we would highlight because honestly, if we have a drug and alcohol issue arrive on our doorstep right now, this will be our go-to person, Pat Wilder, our school social worker. Um, just because she brings so many resources with her from the Howard Center um, that really a lot of it, it is referring out to resources we don't have the capacity in building. So wanted to give Pat a chance just to kind of talk about her holistic role. I know you don't often get to hear from our school social worker, so maybe a little broader than just <coughs> A Todd, but I've asked her to just kind of share her role. And Pat, thanks for being here. Yeah. So I'm Pat Wilder. I've been at Shelburne for, I can't remember if it's seven or eight years. I've had so much fun. Time flies by. Um, but I've been at the Howard Center for 10 years. And um, my role at school is being um, a huge partner. And um, I know Sue Schaefer and I work very closely together and a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. A lot of our kids are shared and um, so we meet uh, almost daily and share information about how kids are doing and uh, which areas they're not doing so well. But I like to be known at school as the um, resource guru. So I have a ton of resources that I know about in our community and um, especially at the Howard Center, but I also have um, a number, and I'm not sure if everybody knows about this number, but I share it with all the parents that I work with and all the service providers, and it's 211. Should anybody ever need any type of resources from uh, a foot doctor to a psychiatrist or anything in between, we have this wonderful resource in the whole state of Vermont, and you dial 211. 
and you will be, uh, it's um, a person, I don't even know where they are in the state, but they will find whatever resources you need for whatever the service might be. So I access that all the time, and I do, um, I probably do about 15 home visits a week. Um, so a lot of my, I designate usually two days, Thursdays and Fridays, and I do all of my home visiting. The rest of the time I do what we call individual counseling, supportive counseling with children one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes in lunch groups. And, but a lot, I think the basis of my work or the piece that I really feel makes a difference is the work that I do with the parents. They're the ones that are struggling. They're the ones that are abusing drugs. They're the ones that are needing help. So before um, it does travel down to the children, um, I think that's where we need to keep some of our focus is helping the families. So I do have like 16 pages of things that I do do in the course <laughs> in the course of a week, but I'm not going to bore you with that. But I did want to share um, the school services brochure just to kind of give you an idea of some of the services that can be provided through the school social worker. And I'm happy to take questions. Are you um, centered at the Howard Center or centered at the school or both? So I have a shared office at Howard. Um, I do travel a couple of kids um, to therapy every week. Mm -hmm. Uh, only because we have um, a school therapist, but she's full right now. And so when I go down and I travel these children because it's important for them to have their weekly therapy, um, I do have an office upstairs that I can, you know, do work, write notes, and check on charts. And But my main office is at Children's School. Mm -hmm. I still think one of the most impressive things was the Alpha Camping trip two years ago. Oh, yes. But Pat came on the three-day Alpha Camping trip because one of her good friends mm -hmm. was somebody who wasn't going to be able to benefit much from that camping trip, not having all the skills she might have needed to interact with the other 70 kids for a three-day time in a different environment. And Pat was her buddy for the entire three days. Mm -hmm. It was an unbelievable way to get to see Pat in action. I was so impressed. Thank you. And it was fun getting no pat. Right. <laughs> Chatted the whole time. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. So what are the public fees? But also, you're, Pat, you're still part of the uh, part two program as yes. well, right? Yes. yes. So that's your I'm other one is part of the job. Really okay. <laughs> Got it. Yep. Dual roles for us. <clears throat> so the last piece we, we talk about is kind of, the, and you can see the connection right to Pat. I mean, obviously we have to connect with parents. So parent outreach, I would put our social worker in that category. And also, uh, just we have some direct parent education. I think it's an area we've made some pretty significant strides this year. It was actually identified in our AYP plan as something that we really need to focus on, building the home and school connection. So. Um, you know, the piece that we would highlight here this year is I think we've had a very successful grand rounds for parents. I think that has been an initiative that we're, we're really proud of. Um, so we've, we've offered some parenting classes. We've screened Hungry Heart, the um, movie about heroin addiction. Um, we've had a session about adolescent suicide attended by parents. We had um, an officer from the Burlington Police Department come talk about cyber safety. In the past, we've had YRBS is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. It comes out every two years. It's really one of our major data collections where we ask kids some pretty direct questions. Um, you know, my, my son came home asking me questions that are like, really? I'm really going to talk about that topic with you? He's like, well, I, I got to ask a question whether I do that. It's like, yeah, we want to know about those risky behaviors. So that's drug use, alcohol use, sexual behavior. Um, and we compare our data to the state. And then what we'll do next year is we'll actually take that data, work with our CY lead program, which is a student leadership group, and they will sit down and have a conversation about our data with parents and with teachers and talk about what does it mean? 
in one of our most telling pieces that really drove some of our curriculum last time was data where we found out that you know it was a small number you know, it, you know when you hear two percent you probably don't get concerned about something that two percent of your students at school are, are involved in right you know what if two percent of your students have consumed can contemplated suicide all of a sudden that changes it and that was that was our number and that got our attention in a big way and that that led us to implement a You Matter Suicide Prevention curriculum with our students and our skills for life and start you know, the parent education piece around it. And that's what YRBS does for us. Now, and, how, do, how do you address cyberbullying? You know, we, we address it directly within our bullying and harassment and skills for life and actually earlier. Um, Katie starts working on, really even with our youngest, our K and one, two, you know, how do we treat each other, and what does it mean to treat each somebody elect respectfully electronically? Mm -hmm. um, because we're starting to open the window. I mean, our third graders are about to sit down at a computer and, and take the SPAC exam. You know, we encourage that kind of computer literacy, so with it comes our curriculum. And they learn sets of standards that yeah. they abide by. Yeah, we have a we have a. Do, do, I mean, if if a child is a victim of cyberbullying. Yeah. Are, are you able to serve as a resource and you know help them yeah. address that? Yes, yeah. on both sides of the equation. We're able to serve as a resource towards the victim and we're able to serve as a resource towards the bullet. Good. In terms of why is this happening, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. and yeah, we're, we're very attuned to it. Doesn't say it doesn't happen. I mean, it's, it's, it's gonna be an ongoing mm -hmm. issue in our society for years to come, but it's definitely part of it. So I believe that's the end yeah, yep. that's kind of the puzzle pieces that we wanted to share with you tonight, so. And just know. before your questions, I did wanna also remind you that it sounds like a real middle school presentation at times because we are talking a lot about our six to eight population, but remember that our K to five population, pre K to five population also has this need. And I'm hoping that over the years we can really grow these programs, these prevention programs, so that they do trickle down more into our younger groups of students. I know resource-wise yeah. that's a bit of a challenge, but um, it all happens, you know, from from when they're young, unfortunately, in this past book about their families. And, yeah, and, and you'll definitely hear much more about that next month because mm -hmm. really that's our counselors working together as a team to provide that curriculum and, and Katie's been an incredible addition Absolutely. to the staff in terms of her work around prevention education down at the K-5s. Especially in light of the numbers that Alice brought, you know, mm -hmm. if you push that action down into the K-5, to those numbers can continue to look good and do, you know, make a difference. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. And thanks to everybody who came tonight. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. That when you up. So, Steph is, Stephanie is here. She, she was late trying to get here for audience communication. We've made the succession before. You guys take care of everything? We've made the succession before, allowing people to speak after that. If you guys are okay with that, we have yeah. Steph speak. Um, sure. It's hard, though, without hearing what, what I missed. Um, I came in support of um, the bond um, I am a parent, two children and children, and um, also a teacher in the district, a science teacher. And so I just wanted to um, sort of exclaim my support and let you know that um, a, a couple points. Um, as a teacher, when I walked down one of those open hallways years ago for the first time, I couldn't believe it. I, I thought to myself, I could never teach in this environment. And um, I walk in there now and it's loud. And so I think about my son who is easily distracted <laughs> and he'll be gone by the time anything is um, updated. But um, you know, that's one of the first things. When I heard about this, I was like, oh, finally. Um, the other thing is I think about safety. That corridor, that open corridor, I've never, I couldn't even believe it when I first saw it. And then, you know, with the danger that is looming, I hope to God we never see anything. I think about how my children can't be locked down in those wings. So when this article came out, that was one. Of the, those were the two things that I, I, I really held on to and I was thankful about. Um, the other thing is that I, I feel, and this is what I say to the parents who are naysayers, my husband is a little bit 
cautious right now as well, um, as he always is, um, that you know, schools, they need to update. Schools need to update. And there's always gonna be people who won't want to pay for it at the time, but that's always gonna be there. And as long as I've lived in Shelburne, no one's asked me to um, support an update. So I'm more than willing, and I know that no one is spending recklessly these days. It's just not happening. And I trust that, that the school is not spending recklessly on this. Um, so you know, that's why I know that it's, it's a fine time for it. Uh, and so I will vote yes. Um, I also have to plug for science, of course. Because um, you know, I know what a science teacher needs, and the science teacher does not need a science lab. But um, a science teacher needs water and electricity. And I know that um, in, um, I know Jackson's room doesn't have that, his science room. And so his teacher, it, it's harder work to do a good job teaching science when you don't have those things. And if his science teacher had those things in a newer classroom and was near a maker space, um, it, it's, it would change a lot as far as good science education. And with um, engineering coming down the pipe, those maker spaces, will be huge if not just to put stuff. I mean, we, we're, the stuff we're gonna need to do good engineering, you won't even believe it, right down to cardboard and bubble wrap and crazy things like that. And so those spaces just for storage alone, you know, never, of course there's gonna be equipment and stuff like that, but I, I just think how important that will be for science. So those science classrooms need to be updated. <laughs> At least the ones that I have seen. Oh, that's what I just wanted to say. <laughs> Sorry that it's a weird time. Thank you. That's a good thing. Have fun. I'm just excited that somebody other than Russ just mentioned engineering in the meeting. Yeah. It wasn't, as, wasn't as a joke against me. Say, usually right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. All right, so um, thanks for the presentations. I didn't get a chance to thank the pre other presenters. Uh, but please we'll tell them thank you. Yeah. Well, that's true. I'll send them an email. Um, and we'll move on to 5 1, the principal's report. All right. So we have a lot of information here because it is a January February combined um, edition, as you can see. Um, we had a PTO meeting, and so we decided to combine the two. So um, the first page pretty much is just really applauding our PTO. We have just an unbelievable um, teacher organization. Um, and we're so appreciative of all the efforts that they have. Just to let you know, we did have our first um, fall grants meeting a while back, and we do two a year, as you probably are aware. And at this um, meeting, the PTO gave out $5,666.30 to our teachers for a number of the grants that they had written, um, some for things like doing slam poetry, um, I, actually a nice set for our kitchen, believe it or not, um, some sewing machines um, for uh, crafts that are being done and, and such. Um, also, our PTO helps to sponsor our Artist in Residence program this year at Boards Come Alive, and that's a collaboration between the Flynn um, Center and uh, the, um, our, local, our local teachers. And it is, I think it starts in fourth grade this year with our, or excuse me, second grade with our, a number of second through eighth grade teachers who um, actually have these artists come into the classrooms and do um, let's say dance, for example, as part of a science unit. So um, very interesting interactive programs. The kids absolutely love it. And as you can see, about 280 of our students get to participate in the programs. Um, and Sally Stevens is the teacher who helps to um, organize all that. Um, our international potluck um, uh, potluck dinner was the end of our celebration of International Week. Um, during that week, we have students who typically speak other languages come in <coughs> and greet us in their native language. Um, the dinner, it's, oh, and we also have dishes that in our cafeteria that Becky Mashik, our food service director, um, prepares um, di different international dishes. 
Um, and then, of course, at the end, on that Friday night, we had our celebration with an int- our international potluck dinner, and I guess about five or 300 to 350 people attended that event, which I could not believe, but Randy said she actually did do a count. So, um, but it was an unbelievable event. Um, our fifth graders do some pop-up books, and they had those all out for display um, of all the different, uh, a number of different countries. And I did just want to mention, if you weren't aware, Jan Bedard is the coordinator of um, our exchange students in the community, and she brought four of the students who are now attending CVU to that dinner, and they brought a dish from their native country, and then they shared um, some, some um, a little bit of their life with the group that was there. So that was kind of a, a fun treat. Um, our PTO sponsored their first bowlathon. It was very successful. They raised over four thousand dollars in one night at a bowling event. I'd like to stress that she just said four thousand dollars. Four thousand dollars. I know. I was absolutely amazed, was but amazing. I did not make a typo yeah. there. It was. It truly did happen. So, but it was. I don't believe there was any gambling there. I don't know, scratch off tickets. I'm not sure. No, no, there was no gambling. No, it was. And no, it was. It was like entrance into the, into the event. Yeah, and a uh, silent auction. A silent auction, um, and that was, you know, they had, they had a limit on tickets. Correct. Yes, mm-hmm. they right, sold seventy five. I don't know how many it was. No, it I sold out in whatever yeah. it was. It sold out in six days. Yep. And I called on the seventh. Yep. <laughs> and and Alan get, called on the eighth. Yeah, and I did not get to go. So <laughs> Yeah, it was a very, very popular event and they will do it again yeah, next year. So school board chair or You know <laughs> Yeah, really. You know, it's, it's oh. a bond year, so I didn't want to play that card. <laughs> well they they did order um six big dishes from Marcos of was it Zidi, she said? Yes. And they only um ate one because people tended to eat finger food instead. So I guess uh, you know, a lot of people benefited from the, a lot of the leftover Z. <laughs> um, and then Mix It Up Day is our day where we basically um, have li- have two groups of pre-K through eighth grade. So everybody mixes it up. So maybe a kindergarten grade uh, class, excuse me, is with an eighth grade class, or a sixth grade class is with a fourth grade class, whatever it might be. And then they do projects together. It's about the last hour of school, and we're doing it three times this year. We did it once last year. It was very successful, and the kids just absolutely love it. They um, establish these partnerships, and for a community school, it's just so important for us to have those kind of opportunities. Excuse me, opportunities, and um, the, you know the kids really look up to their mentor, um, big friends that they establish through that. Um, and then just to highlight that we had a couple of concerts: our kindergarten concert and our grades four and five concert the last couple of months. And the kindergarten concert is so cute that if you haven't seen it in a while, I highly suggest that you watch them as they sing and dance their little hearts out. So. I feel like I don't get to see Tony Chestnut anymore. Tony I'm Chestnut. So My kids are so old. <laughs> oh, you can always come back. I know. Yeah, I should, I we welcome you yeah. to come see that. Nothing better than that. So big shout out for Peter Antonosi, he's our SCS champion for GOB, and after tomorrow we'll be able to have a shout out for our new script spelling champion, but that doesn't happen until 12.30 tomorrow, so. <laughs> big day, big day Next tomorrow. Time. Oh, stressing yeah. at home. <laughs> yeah. uh, our code, um, I'd like to highlight that, that was an effort pulled together by Ellen Matthews, our technology coordinator, and Carrie Ahern, um, technology specialist, librarian. And what they did, it's, it's a nationwide program designed to get every child to try computer coding for an hour. And so they arranged for every student in our school to have within that week to, to have an hour to go online and try it. And uh, great outcome. I, we're still seeing students who will now go to the lab and log onto the site because all the activities kind of continue. And we've got some kids intrigued about coding, which they say is one of the you know, key job opportunities of the future is being able to operate these machines rather, you know, get inside them rather than just be on top of it. Our um, grandson came home and wanted to teach us how to code. Cool. They told us where we, go, where we could go online yeah. to learn the, the site. Yeah, and, it, and if you want to promote it, why not hire a supermodel to um, right. talk yeah. about coding and have a live <laughs> video chat with her. So we got to participate in that. Isn't um, that crazy? Yeah. 
So then Red Ribbon Week, I mean, a lot of these others tie in with prevention. Really, we have our Red Ribbon Week. That was a while ago, but it's sponsored by our CY LEAD students, and this was a school-wide effort. The theme was Kindness Counts, and if you walk through the school during budget, you might have seen the line of shoes that went through the, through the entire building. That was a mix-it-up activity, just the idea of walking a mile in somebody else's shoes. So real fun activity that week. Um, we had a mentoring celebration, bringing all our mentors together under Alice's work. I just can't say enough good things about what Alice has done for oh, that program. Um, it, it literally is triple the size, and it's, it's vibrant in a way that it, it hasn't been in my time there. Um, and then Grand Rounds, we talked about those. So unless you have questions about them, those will continue. And you can just look in the back and see that our enroll enrollment remains stable. And if you guess, when does kindergarten registration start is it uh april 6th will be our our Zero. screening our first day of screening and um we currently have 79 students <laughs> enrolled for kindergarten hmm. 78 teachers. 78 or nine yeah. one of the other 78 yeah. we're there but yep. we're at that threshold already which is nice yeah. yep the comment you made about mix it up and finding friends around the school i mean i know that's like my son can look at pictures on the school website and tell me who's been in his mix it up day and that's you're right it allows that's the goal little kids in one side of the building to meet big kids on the other and say hi to them as yeah. they walk by it's really yeah. cool i really like it thank you yeah, um, another thing like with that and with the mentoring the other thing he mentions is his book buddy mm -hmm. does the literacy program run the book buddies nope. or the is one that... he's talking about i bet is sue schaefer's is um okay. where she's matching up kids through the eighth grade um, right pairing some, um, some students who service. we think would really benefit from connecting with a younger peer so it's, it's really for the benefit of the middle school student and oh here's yeah. something that would be really productive why don't you why don't you go down here and help us be a leader because this would be really good for them okay. yeah all right yeah yeah that's another thing my son talks about yeah that's awesome. a fun program and instead of you said, what did you say for the hour of code during this week, we'd like these kids to try coding for an hour. My daughter in every hour tries to code for a week. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since then. Ever since then. Yeah, that's pretty um, amazing. So all right. Yeah. Look, uh, that's, that's the ticket that's that's she's talking about. That's great. Yeah. So thanks for that. Um, so that's the end of that. Go to 5-2 CSSU debrief. We were all there. Um, it's not really much to talk about uh, from that. Uh, well, Megan's presentation was pretty impressive. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> not that I meant, that's not what I meant. We don't need to review any of it. Back, 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 back. Okay. Uh, sorry, Megan, that's not what I meant. But yeah, I mean, that's good. As I, as I was listening to that, I was remember one of my, the first time I ever confronted Russ in a budget meeting was uh, was on early childhood education. When confronted he, or experienced? <laughs> <laughs> you are an experienced Russ. <laughs> was defending like the importance of what a difference it makes to you know small changes at a young age make a big difference at a latter age. So um, that was great. Yeah, really, whenever talk about that subject and, and hear about it it's so easy to think well that's not really our problem or that shouldn't be a school responsibility and then you have to come back to but it will become and it will be that much harder if we don't deal with it yeah. as soon as as soon as you have the opportunity that cost diagram yes. that that was amazing I've never seen that before more people should see that it's great it, it just um, brings to light how much the school is really the center of the community for all parents and children and grandparents, for everybody, because they feel the result of what happens in the school. <laughs> all right, uh, move on to 5-3, which is the second quarter financial management report and I did read over that, and it looks like we're down from $122,000 to in the 40s. Is, yes. that, is that what I see? Okay. I was The first time I read that, I think I read the draft version that was up yesterday that started with a number, added the fund balance, and then came back to another. But So 42 is moving in the right direction. That's great. So, all right. So... 
facilities committee update. I thought we had taken this off of the agenda for this week, but do you have anything to no. talk about? We're just nothing new. We're just waiting for keeping the vote. going. Yeah, waiting for the vote. I know you did lay out a preliminary schedule of the. There have been some questions about schedule <coughs> and about how things would move around in the school. Those are the two questions that parents have. Um, so trying to address those. So um, trailers, lots of trailers. Lots of trailers. Yeah. We'll talk about that. At, we'll talk about that at six point three. Um, there is no such thing as modular. Yeah. This is Vermont. <laughs> so we'll go to five five, which would be the leadership team overview. So, which this was. Did you have that? Mm -hmm. Okay. You gave me that blank look like, like what's why are you looking at me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you remember this? Yep. Okay. So it was just meant to be a verbal update yeah, is, yeah, is yeah. what I was understanding. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we, we had asked, I think the thing we had talked about in retreat was we've heard, you know, about results that have come out of the leadership team, so we just wanted to know what is the leadership What is it made team? up of? Yep. How do you, what do you guys do? Purpose. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So what we have is a we ref, we refer to them as a leadership team. It's in a second year second year of existence. It is twelve members of faculty that meet biweekly from um, three fifteen to five thirty. So it, it's an after school. We actually stipend these members, um, and they have a specific mission of providing um, feedback and. Um, advice to administration around issues of school climate and actually that purpose took a long time for us to develop um, you know, as when we came together after the AYP plan and really our leadership change grew from the AYP plan which said okay we need to build homeschool co homeschool communication we also need to modify the governance and so that was one of our plans was to modify the governance because previously what the leadership team had been was um, it, it met during the school day and it really came together and the group would look at each other and say, okay, who's got something that, that needs to be addressed in the school? And spend a lot of time talking about, well, you know, it's really problematic when the kindergartners and the first graders come together at recess and dealing with those. And so our effort has been to significantly elevate the level of conversation here. This has become a group, when we come together this Thursday afternoon, We'll be reviewing the AYP plan, looking at the specific tasks that we have had before us and, and creating an update there, and then share out, share out of groups who are dealing with four major projects around the school. Um, those projects include um, developing common language around our discipline program, recognizing that that has a significant impact on climate. Um, we are going to, going to look at, you want to take the others? No, go ahead, go ahead. Yep. So, um, it's, it's that piece. It is looking <laughs> at um, developing our curriculum and getting curriculum alignment around our school. We've been working with Bill Rich, a consultant, um, recognizing that you know, as we're heading towards PLPs, we've got to have that curriculum alignment, so we're looking at how are we going to do that. And this group provides us advice on the structures and even what we should be doing in terms of in-service. Um, this group is intimately involved in scheduling. I mean, nothing is probably you know, your, your teachers are important, but if you don't deploy your staff and create a schedule that makes sense, you know, if you break up their day into these finite little chunks, y you really end up with ineffective education, and schedules are very complicated. So this group worked very hard last year developing a set of pillars around which our master schedule is now based, you know, and that is assuring that teachers have common planning time and a chance to have conversations around students and curriculum that we will, so let me think. Make sure I got it because I don't have my note there. So common planning time, intervention blocks, that's building from our system of MTSS so that we are specifically providing opportunities through the day for all students to get either intervention for remediation or acceleration. Okay. And the other piece is extended blocks of time. How can, we, how can we have instruction that happens not in 40 minute periods but teachers are asking, I want to see my, I want to see my kids for two hours straight, I want to see my kids for three hours straight. And so those are the pillars around which it was based, and that actually led to some significant changes last year, led by the leadership team, and even how we're using our unified arts teachers. You, you may have heard that some of our staff moved from being, you know, for years I'd been a K-2 art teacher. Well, 
Now we're a K-5 art teacher, or we're a K-8 PE teacher, because in order to get those pieces, we really had to stretch ourselves so that we could have a full group of students go to Unified Arts so that teachers could have that collaboration time. So it, it was a shift, and it's a shift of mindset, and right now we're in the midst of reviewing it. So that, that's kind of the work that this, this group is doing. Um, there, there's one other initiative that we're looking at from the Jigsaw, if I remember right. Um, Long-term it, vision. our vision, I was gonna say. Yeah. Just solidifying our vision and our purpose. Yeah. Um, you might remember that uh, Program Council is what this was called, and it was it is actually part of the teacher contract, the master agreement, um, that all of the schools will have a Program Council, and it's it was originally intended for transformational education. So this kind of all falls under that. So we're really looking at being more, really using this governance structure to be more innovative and creative in the ways that we um, just do, as Alan just said, whether it's scheduling or whatever it might be. but. Um, you know, the idea that when 12 people get together and talk, it is much more interesting than when two people just sit and talk, so. Yeah. And, and I guess what I would do is, you know, I would invite you any, every mm -hmm. other Thursday afternoon. Yeah. It, it's, it's an open meeting. Obviously, we have some group that are incredibly committed. We ask them to, you know, short of a family emergency, you've made a commitment. You're part of our leadership team. You know, we, we need you there on Thursday afternoons. Um, but we also have other staff that will come and do presentations and, and, and share information. And you'd be welcome at those meetings anytime. Absolutely. So. Do you have any um, teachers who are doing two or three blocks of te uh, hours for, for teaching yet? Are, are you able to schedule that kind of thing? You know, we have I, our longest blocks at middle school are two hours. That's, wow. that's what we've been able to create there. Um, and I think we approach that in some of our... K5. I was going to say, I, th I think the way that you would look at it, Kathy, is more like in literacy, for example, um, best practice is a 90-minute block of literacy for um, second grade, let's say, for example. So within that block, though, it is divided into some more discrete pieces, but they kind of interweave with each other. But the idea is that that 90 minutes won't be interrupted by a unified arts class mm -hmm. or by recess or lunch or whatever that might be. So that was kind of the agreement that when when kids get on a roll, <laughs> you know, it's really hard. I mean, they need movement. They need those kind of things. Frequently during those big blocks, they might be eating snack or something like that, but they're working at the same time. So they don't have to have that disruption. Those transitions are really hard on all kids, I think, but particularly younger children. Yep. And if you were to, even in those two to three hour blocks, don't imagine students sitting with a teacher up front for two to three hours. A absolutely not. I mean, that would that anymore. kill us. Yeah. You know? And so, <laughs> don't do that um, anymore. what are we at right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just about there. Yeah. So it's, it's more that flexibility to say, what can I do to hook these kids? And once I've got them, yeah. then I want them working on this project. I want them creating this project. Then I want them sharing the project. And I need the time to do that because just when you're ready to roll, it's like, oh, we'll come back to this tomorrow because you need to go. It's like, no, that doesn't work. Yeah. And that's really what we're going to try to move to in personalized education. I mean, if we talk about where we think education right. might be in five to ten years, when our leadership team starts talking about it, it gets really exciting. And then the pragmatics get really overwhelming. I mean, when but you talk, work through it. yeah, when you talk about like bringing next generation science standards in, it's all about how do you interweave like literacy with science, and you have to have time to be able to do all that, and you can't say, oh, it's time to go to, you know, it just doesn't work that way. So, so probably it'll the, be interesting. Probably the biggest change in the leadership model is I know when Patty and I sit and we have our conversations, a lot of our conversations go, that's a really interesting idea. We should bring that to the leadership, the leadership team, team. Yeah. rather than that's a really interesting idea, we're going to make it happen. I mean, we really move beyond we're going to make it happen to how are we going to make this happen. And it, because if they own it too, then obviously yeah. they're sharing that ownership with all of the other teachers and their colleagues. So uh, it just makes sense. Cool. Great. Right. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. So move on to discussion matters 6-1. The budget informational meeting, which is the night before town meeting, mm -hmm. or it is town meeting on that night, yeah. I imagine. Night before voting. It's just going to be a repeat of our forum presentation. I know Bob, it's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. questions about buses, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's going for six to one. Six questions about the bus, one question about math. That's what we're doing. Yeah, who's on first? 
They are. They are. Town. Okay. Okay. Town. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's going to be a late night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boy. But I, I, I don't think so, though. I mean, the town budget's pretty quiet. There's no, everyone's running unopposed, which I find surprising. Which I found out when I went to vote early. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so Bob had sent out a note with the presentation, so we'll just modify that. What? How does that work? Do you present each article separately? Is Tom Little? I can't remember. Like, I mean, there's some of them that get voted from the floor. Yeah. And then there are the you know the, the big money ones that um, are, are on the Australian ballot the next day. Ballot so I think each yeah. of them does get <coughs> considered separately or, or, or gets discussed separately. Mm -hmm. So we'll discuss the budget, yeah. and then they'll have questions, mm -hmm. and then we'll discuss the bond. They'll have mm -hmm. questions, and then I don't know mm -hmm. anything else. And you guys will both be there. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Tom Little is mm -hmm. a great resource. I mean, he, he really yeah, keeps he it going. It's good, yeah. He's yeah. fantastic. So okay, it makes it easy. Yeah. And I, we have the copy of it, and we're going to change the figures. Obviously, you know, a little bit for the presentation since the last presentation when you know the budget went from thirteen whatever to twelve. What you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Okay. But other than that, okay, sounds good. Um, any last uh, board's corners articles you want to write? Uh, I can write Russ, something. As you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh me no. Before you know, you want to write one before Actually, uh, two weeks from now. What what it really should be is a recognition of Russ's Russ. service. No, yeah. that would that no. I mean that's yes. an appropriate mm. thing. No, that's fine. Yeah, that I think that's a great thing to do. How, How many, many years, that? Russ? What? Nine. How many years? Nine. 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 That's, That's nothing. I mean, Grant Bush and Jed Graff, right. they both did like 13, 14 oh, wow, or really? something like that. So, yeah, yeah. nine's easy. That's <laughs> <laughs> a piece of cake. Yeah. Just shy of a decade. You know, there's a couple of people on the, you know, on the CSSU board, like 17, 18 yes. years. Oh, I mean, you you, you can have a discussion about, how, you know, whether there's such a thing as too long. Right. But, um, okay. <laughs> you know, nine years, that's, that's a walk in the park. <laughs> I don't know, is there anything past the election that we want to talk about, or we just want to wait till March and see how things sugar out? There is somebody, you say Matt Wormser, is he Matt on the, Wormser's is there anybody yes. else, or is that all that made the, uh, I the, I actually, actually, pretty, right in. Say, actually, actually, I, the ballot, I, isn't I, I give you credit, yeah, you know, <laughs> that, uh, or give him credit that somebody actually did petitions this time, it wasn't a write-in, so that's all. <laughs> well, because it's because we worked thing. hard to recruit him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... All right. So, hearing no disagreement with waiting till next month, we'll not make any decisions on a board's corner article because Bob seems to write one every week nowadays. It seems. <laughs> uh, well, maybe maybe the Shelburne News should do the you know the story on, about Rush. Hmm, and, maybe and that's fun. Right? I don't think Rush really wants that. <laughs> <laughs> Big picture, front page. Yeah. So we'll move on right. to. Uh, no, if there, it, you know, if, if there ends up being a committee someday, I'll, I'll wear that too. Nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> What's funny is somebody went and had that made. That's pretty good. Is it actually made? Yeah. Yeah, Gene Jensen so. had it made out. Of <laughs> oh my! I thought it was actually like you know somebody just like. She she it, on kind it, of looks like, it looked like she might have made it at home. Yeah. yeah. But, okay. She uh, probably ironed down an <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. 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 or you know, printer you know, transfer that, that or you know, printed it out of her computer. Right. She went to Cafe yeah. Press yeah. and made, yeah. Uh, yeah. made one of them. Yeah. That's so, great. It's like it was a pretty low tech effort. Thought the So we'll move on to six three here. Six three is a a proposal brought to us and. It's to have the school board sponsor a grant for the playground. Mm -hmm. And to give you some background, this came up probably to all of our attention in a, the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the grant application is due this week sometime. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is it's an opportunity through the um, Land and Water Conservation Fund um, at the state level to get matching funds 
for the playground for this playground project um, and it's not you know because the playground project has grown I don't know if you've seen any of the pre the uh, presentations and flyers that have come out it's not just equipment but we have the pavilion path trees even um, a little concrete pad down by the new gym for wall ball I know that's a I big thing you can't wait for that that's like right outside your office <laughs> I think we should put some screens up there <laughs> and we're going to be paying for some glass. Uh, one of the aspects that it has in there is, I know I'll get the statute wrong, I don't know if it's 6F3 or 63F in the code, but you need to set aside the school fields in perpetuity to be only used as a park um, and as a I don't know if it's specifically as a conserved land, but basically no development in excess of use as a park <coughs> for this piece of land. The town managers got involved in this discussion um, just because the school leases the property from the town for 99 years just to get them involved. Uh, we're reviewing the you know, Lisa Williams is reviewing the deed with a lawyer to try and figure out who really needs to make this decision. I know there's some trepidation about the use of perpetuity. Um, and my interpretation of that is if you just look at that and you say perpetuity and you're worried about saying something about this property forever, I mean, it's a park located next to a school where I don't see us putting in a gas station or a set of condos or anything. No, but does it, does it preclude... 50 years from now, uh, this is the, you know, this is considered you know, the American South, um, and, and it's warm and everybody wants to move here. Uh, does it preclude building a larger school that, that on it? I mean, you know, not, not you know, for residential or, or commercial development, mm -hmm. but could you expand the school onto that space? You know, that's, that is, that is a great concern, and I... I can see that as one of the possibilities where this would be a problem. However, at that time, you would have to say, the reason we got this grant was a playground that was, that perhaps died 30 years ago. So I'm sure that at that point in time, there could be. Well, how, I mean, how big is this grant that, you know, if we're talking about two grand. We're, uh, no. to, we're probably, you know, I mean, we're probably talking about realistically getting Thirty to eighty thousand dollars from this. That's real money. And, and probably, you know, I would say that it would probably be more around fifty grand. I mean, they've. What, the reason I said thirty to eighty is because you're gonna. If you see the grant come out, it's gonna have a really large number in it. Because aim high. Yeah. And you'll get what you know what you. Make no, it, need, it, so. I mean, it's it's real money. It, yeah. You know, for 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 five grand, you'd say it's not worth it, and you know why why tie our hands on it, but. I you know, did 50 speak with Justin Savage, who was the grant kind of administrator, and she said that you can obviously, if that happened 50 years from now, you could write something into this to say, you know, we would need more land to expand our building or something of that nature. So she said um, that is a clause that's allowed. The possibility. That the possibility. Not for sure that you would get it, but you can certainly make that play, in other words. Yeah. How far into, I, I never realized it was a 99-year lease at the town. How far into our 99 years are we? I don't know. I don't know. That's a weird, that. yeah. 67? Yeah. So you're 40 oh, years yeah. into it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe that's the case. 47. You're halfway through. So, um, so, so this is a discussion matter, but it's due this week. No, it's a well, it's a discussion matter for us. What we've done, we've the committee has filed the application with, you know, the full knowledge that the board is going to discuss this. We've, you know, as the chair, I said I'll tentatively discuss this and I I'll approve submitting this, you know, with the understanding that after we discuss this and we act on it next month, if something comes up, we'll rescind our application. Yeah, or, or you might have to turn down the grant. Yeah. And they would rescind the application anyway because they would say there isn't correct permitting to be able to continue with the grant process. Yeah. Because they do need that permitting to be able to continue. 
Yep. So. And so who does his permitting? Well, that's the part that Dave said. That part's sticky to me. I, I don't know. So you're, which permitting are you referring to? The, like cha changing the land over to a, to that, to a LWCF 6F3. Correct, yep. Um, so is I mean, this dealing with land use regs? Is that what we're talking about? Here? It's basically land putting land a land, land yeah, yeah, it's putting a land use reg onto a different land use reg onto mm -hmm. our school fields. Uh, I think the town has to do that, don't they? So it's not clear who <coughs> actually has to do it. And so both of us are going to get involved. So the, the town's going to have a discussion on this in the next week or so, and then they're going to act two weeks later mm -hmm. um, and then if we approve it and they approve it then that would clear the way to you know towards moving forward um, second of all there's already been a permit for that's in front of the development review board a building permit yes that had to be filed in for advance of this yeah. so that is up for discussion tomorrow at the development review board just to get the permit so that the confines and the plans of the project can be in the application as well. How can we get more information about this so that when we have a discussion next month, we have, we're more informed? Yeah, about so it? we can pass the, the completed application on to you guys so you can review it. Okay. I know this, this, I apologize that this just came up. Um, okay. I think these, the land use issue is probably the biggest issue. and. You know, the, I'll pass this stuff on and you folks can read it, but I think that, you know, if, you know, conserving our school parks in perpetuity is really not such a big heartache, I would believe. It, it seems kind of like a no-brainer in, in order to get some extra funds for this playground. Um, I really don't see any downside except for if you want to build a school at a later day. Well, so what if the school moves? Well, then you have a park in perpetuity that, you know, you, you know. You're saying if, the physical, if, if, if that building were closed, and say, say the town take it, you know, it, it, it becomes a set, set of condominiums or something like that, you know, it converted to, you know, residential use or something like that. Yeah, I mean, and that's. It's, it's happening. the town can just go it ahead happens. and do that when the town has granted the land to a school. I don't think they can just take it back and develop it into something else. No, I, I think what Bob is saying is if you, um, you know, Playground. 20, 20 years from now, there, there's Champlain Valley, uh, El, you know, Union Elementary School. And, you know, all the kids, all the kids got bussed over here to Heinsburg. <laughs> Uh, and, and there was no longer a Shelburne Community School and a Charlotte Community School, what happens to that property? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it could be, you know, the building could be cut up into condos or, you know, turned into whatever. Uh, you know, what happens then? So that's, I, now I see your, your question. And, and when I give you the packet, you'll understand. No part of this land includes the footprint of the building. It is all of the fields that are behind the building. So it's 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 everything that's grass. But did it devalue the property? And, and so then what no, would be it, the downside of that change anyhow? I mean, why why wouldn't we still go for that grant to do that to the park? I mean, we can't see into the future and wonder what's going to happen and what would happen to this property. So why wouldn't we go for that grant and develop a playground for the use what what would be the downside i mean this would be a piece of green space that could be used by any of the neighborhoods residents of the condos that are located at children <laughs> community school yeah, they can get out and play soccer yeah, yeah. It's a, you know it you might know, be a, it might be retired you know, retired citizens, they can get out could and play the, football, touch football the, and all that. Yeah. You know, it would be great. It could be the Bob Finn residence. Geriatrics. <laughs> well, we've turned a lot of elementary schools into 
Yeah, what's the one on uh, Pine Street I, from uh, I guess elementary the, school? I guess the question is, what would be the restrictions, the long-term restrictions on the use of that uh, so uh, parcel of land? It, it would not restrict any of the current activities that go on there right now. Baseball games, um, soccer games, lacrosse, uh, bake sales for the PTO during the Newbury Cup, stuff like that. You know, I even asked the question, like, would this inhibit adding a, a dugout for the baseball field? And they're like, no, 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 that's, it's all related to recreation. If the, if the somehow Little League started playing there again and they wanted to build a snack bar like they did at Town Hall, that's something that would probably be an issue. How about a go-kart track? A go-kart track? <laughs> well, you know, it's recreation. It is <laughs> recreation. That would be creative. That would be good. You just have to uh, Skateboard. see. You know, it, it, I think you, you've got to get a lawyer to, to really look at it and to understand what kind of handcuffs this is really putting mm -hmm. on us if, um, if we were, you know, the town and the, and the school were to agree to it. And that's, that's pretty much where the town manager came in, if, you know, in his review. So that's what we're going to take some time to review and give a, you know, give you a report out. Um, I mean, there's two layers. There's the review of the application that's going on as well as both sides are reviewing the, the lease itself with the school. Mm -hmm. So to see who makes this decision, so. Um, so it's due just to let you know the 16th of February. What do we mean? So no, it's, it's yesterday. It yesterday. <clears throat> so they submitted it with tentative, you know, pending approval. No, it was didn't. all pending yeah. approval. Yeah. So, um, and then there's a presentation sometime in March. 16th of, of March. Of course, it's the day before we meet, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll figure out how to handle that. Is the town lawyer reviewing this, or do we have our own lawyer that reviews? So the town lawyer is reviewing, is reviewing that. I know that Lisa Williams had someone reviewing, a lawyer, an attorney, uh, reviewing the, the deed of the property as well as the application from her side as well. So we'll share the application. Do you want us to share it with you? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save some electrons and we won't send it to you. All right. So, I, and I totally understand these are, these are the first couple of concerns that I had as well. Like, but I sort of feel like how would we develop this property as sort of an extreme at the end of its life? Um, if we're, if our school is closed down in 20, 30 years and not operating, that that's the sign of other problems that we may have that really will put whether or not we can develop a small park into something else kind of lower on the priority list so okay. so with that we'll move to uh, 7.1 which is action matters which is to remind everyone that our uh, <coughs> retreat date is Monday June 1st and not the previous Friday okay I got a motion to uh, so move Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, Can motion passes. Can I throw a question about that? Just because a couple months out, sometimes it's a little easier for Patty and I to kind of plan what you'd like to see at that retreat. You know, I mean, we can we can go by what we've done in the past, which is kind of state of the school and that, but I don't think I've ever asked openly. Does that work? Is that valuable? Or, or, or would there be something else that you'd like us to Together. prepare for that? Because with this time, we certainly can follow your lead. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm jumping out of me. Um, I can't remember. Last year, we, we put the whole facilities thing on the agenda. Um, it may be there again this year, depending upon the vote. Could be. Um, in which case, it w might not be a bad idea to discuss. Unless you had the playground on there. And right, that might playground. be appropriate as well, given the mm -hmm. time of mm -hmm. things. Yeah. There was some question about the deed on that uh, wetland that we've got on Route 7. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know where that stands. And 
that was because of the of a sun tracker perhaps mm -hmm. going there, but that's not being pursued as far as I know yeah. at this point. But right? we had to, there was some, I mean, that was given to the, the school with some kind of a, um, a, restriction. a restriction attached to it, and mm -hmm. I think we had to do a title search or some kind yeah. of a Dave, search. David Taylor would to love to have me if have a conversation with you about it, but... If, if we were going to put do something we voted, other than We voted in October not to spend the money on the deed search. Right. right. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I forgot. Okay. Yep. Right, right, right. Okay. So, but if you'd like to hear a presentation on no, solar. No, Yeah. The, the power. May I speak? Mm. To, yeah. Just um, because what, what has come from the state and through Bob is there, there are now companies in the wings that to no cost will come in and offer you a proposal for developing a tracker system on that site. Right. They will ta they will handle the deed. They will handle that. Um, the state's working on what that percentage of cost would be. Um, it's all being negotiated kind of at the visbit level, but that work's being done. They've got the contracts worked out. Um, it, it's a genuine possibility. And I mean, it's, it's okay to revisit again <coughs> if we could get a cleaner presentation from the vendor. Yeah. That doesn't include the Randolph neighborhood that the guy, the vent, the map that we got in the last presentation that okay. it didn't have the right site, wasn't really well prepared by him. Okay. Um, and, you know, you know, if there are time frames that we can act on because I know he, he sent yeah, that to you in December and we didn't have a meeting to act on so there's nothing we can really do about yeah. that. Let me find out. Yeah. I, I can come back to you and tell you next month whether it's even viable, whether it's worth yeah. putting it on the agenda. Because we've had, what, it was the first question at the forum. Right. <laughs> it was Kate Lally's question at the uh, Planning Commission. Was it? So, uh -huh. um, and Taylor Ricketts came after me at, uh, <laughs> I came after, Kate, Taylor Ricketts asked me about solar the other day. Our local renewable energy celebrity. So, um, okay. Right. State of the school and possibly some <coughs> facilities, solar, and who knows. Um, so, before we go into the consent agenda, I kind of feel like the 175 day calendar is kind of like we've never really, I've seen it, we've never really talked about it. So just to clarify, that yeah. is the superintendent's approved calendar that there really isn't yeah. any okay. discussion. You, What you will get later after we approve this one is the calendar that has wh what are our professional development days, which of those regional days do we turn into student days. So right. this one is on here with out discussion. And I don't, I, don't have, I don't have any problems with it. I just want to ask a quick question is like, is there a, a is it almost certain that the starting day on that calendar will be our starting day on the 26th of August? That is the, that would, that, so that's a student day de defined by the uh, superintendents. Yeah. We would then be inserting our professional development days and yeah. may or may not be adjusting that student start day. Okay. Right. Just curious, because like, you know, this year we have a really late ending, which, Thanks to some snow days, we'll be <coughs> later. And it, like I think Labor Day is later this year, so it is right. It's as late as it can be. We won't have the three, four, five start. <coughs> no, right. like we'll for the first three, time in a we'll have a three, long five, time. four start. So, that's right. Okay. Yep. That's the question I just wanted to yep to make clear. Okay. So uh, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All right. And. Uh, all those, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right. So we are meeting here on the 17th, and then we're meeting on the 14th in April. And um, reminder, we meet on the 17th at 5 p.m. Uh, if we will meet at 5, oh, actually, we may meet 5.30. I mean, because there is no common topic that day. We could meet at 5.30, do our board reorganization. Um, we'll make that decision at the agenda meeting two weeks in advance of that meeting. So I'll let you know, probably. 
Um, I'll probably it'll probably be the five thirty. Something I probably will let you know. <laughs> so, and, uh, with that, can I get a motion to go into executive session? So I would move to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters. That's a great idea, Russ. Thank you. I'll, I would second that motion. Okay. okay. All right. And we will adjourn from the executive we'll session. Adjourn from executive session.